Are you struggling to lose weight and keep it off? Tired of wasting time and money on starvation diets that lead to more frustration and stress? If there was a weight loss solution that could actually work for you, would you try it? Then head to golo.com. I'm Steve. I lost 138 pounds in nine months on Golo. I'm Amber. I've lost 128 pounds with Golo. If you're ready to take back control of your life, head to golo.com now and see how Golo can work for you. That's golo.com. My sleep is way better. My inflammation has gone way down. Golo saved my life. I was way overweight. That's what sent me down the path. I wanted to make sure and live for my kid. I have literally tried everything. I was on the verge of getting gastric bypass surgery, and I saw the Golo commercial, and it was the last thing I tried because it worked. Join over 2 million people who found a better way to lose weight with Golo. Your healthier and happier life begins at Golo.com. That's G-O-L-O.com. Again, G-O-L-O.com. Will you hear the unexplained voices talk underneath Stephen Dawn about the equipment Stephen Dawn is setting up. It just riddled and blew my mind when they were able to show me that audio file of a mysterious male voice talking to another mysterious male voice. Clear as day, like I'm talking to you. Wendy's Coffee House. Hello, I'm Wendy. Okay, my guest I've talked to before, Keith Linder, and he is the author of now of three books and The Bothell Hill House, Poltergeist of Washington State kicked it off. And then there are the other two attachments, Poltergeist of Washington State Part 2 and Poltergeist, the Night Side of Physics. Keith is an IT guy. Given that background, he's been able to do a whole lot more investigating, getting some kind of tangible proof of the hauntings that he has experienced. One of the interesting things, and one he's able to validate, was the mattress, hearing heartbeats in a mattress. You don't get that every day. I sent the audio file to friends of mine who some knew about my paranormal, some didn't, but they were doctors and nurses in the medical field, EMT, firemen, who know a little bit about EKG and heartbeats and whatnot. And I gave it to a heart specialist, a heart surgeon, one of my friends, and it blew their mind. They said, whoever has this, because they got the chart and they took EKG and all that stuff, they're like, Whoever has this heart is a person that's about to die. Keith's story began without him actually being interested or in any way, shape, or form connected to things that we would call occult or paranormal. When did this start for you? Oh, this was uh, May 2012. So we're 2022. This is <laughs> this has followed you. And you're absolutely, from what I can tell, obsessed, but also engaged, and you get results. So for anyone who's ever had any kind of experience living in a haunted house and then not being able to shake it, and we're talking like Skinwalker Ranch, when you go there and the thing follows you home, this is what Keith is living. Three books, right? Three books. And how many documentaries? Oh, wow. Uh, Official, maybe one official and maybe five unofficial documentaries, all on YouTube for free. Four on my channel, uh, one on YouTube. You're talking about maybe 12, 14 hours of poltergeist content on the documentaries alone. These are people who've had their own experiences in your space saying, holy cow. All right, so who was the one that I think you scared the most? Probably the U.S. team, uh, Nikki Novell and uh, Carissa Hartley, who stayed in the house three and a half weeks and lived in the home and saw Bible pages turning uh, by themselves. There was a shadowy figure incident. Uh, There was some electronic equipment malfunction or manipulation. Uh, One of the investigators was attacked while sleeping. So I would definitely say it was the U.S. team that had their own, you know, scary episode, if you will. The thing about hauntings is sometimes they're attached to certain people. Sometimes they are a specific time of day when it's more active or time of the month or, you know, the location. It's different with different people. Yeah. And one of the things we experienced, me and me and Tina, what people fail to understand about poltergeist hauntings is me and Tina, like most people listening to your show, we're just doing everyday stuff in the home. We're not ghost hunting. We're not investigating. I might be in the kitchen unloading the dishwasher. And I hear a noise, I turn around, and my furniture has been re- 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 rearranged. And it happens in the blink of an eye. I was not expecting that. Or 
the light goes off or the light comes on, TV starts to channel surfing by itself. It's those common things that, you know, it's not malfunction, it's something doing that. Uh, whereas the investigator comes in and they come in, not all, but most come in, show me, show me, show me, show me, show me. Me and Tina never say, show me, show me, show me. They volunteer, you know, but they volunteer on their terms. So it's got to be when you least expect it, taking a shower, shaving, ironing your clothes, surfing the internet, and then they do it. Because that's to their advantage then. It's not to me to put a tripod in my hallway and say, okay, go show me, throw that Bible again. It's not going to do it, you know, for, for multiple reasons. But a lot of teams come in there expecting that the whatever is there is going to do that for the simple fact that it's them that investigate, like, oh, me, 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 Mr. Big Investigator, goes do what I say. And, and, and I've never seen that happen. It didn't happen to me and Tina. We lived there. Didn't you have some kind of a, an initial response going into the house from, from day one, you know, going through, there was something that triggered you? Yeah, with the day, May 1st, 2012, we heard, we heard the kids call. I mean, it was a real loud, distinguishable kid call. And how I know that is because me and Tina were sitting on the floor. The house is empty. The homeowner had just left. And there's no power. There's no utility. There's nothing to the house. And as we're talking, something interjects loud coming from upstairs. And it was a kid call because I looked at Tina. She looked at me. And we, both, we both said at the same time, was that a kid call? And that's how real it sounded. Now, we didn't. At that time, the ghost of Portuguese, we just shrugged it off. But it was weird. It stopped whatever we were talking about. And we have no kids. You know, there's no kids upstairs. We didn't even get up to go investigate because we have no brush with the paranormal whatsoever. We just, our mind just deduced that as to, man, I have to be car passing by or next door neighbor or something. But, wow, that sounded like a kid call. And then fast forward months later, with the kid toys appearing in odd places, then you start playing connected dots like, oh, oh, it's all connected. Oh, and then you look online and the websites online give you a good template or bullet point as to what to expect and look for. And we were passing with flying colors. This is the Bothell Hill House, Poltergeist of Washington State. This story in 2012 that's your beginning of trying to get up to speed on what the heck you're dealing with, realizing you're, you're spending time with a poltergeist because you've got two more books after this, and then Tina is gone. What yeah. happened going forward? Well, um, like most poltergeist cases, the activity intensified. Um, we reached out for help locally and statewide, nationwide, and the activity escalates both physical and mental. You know, there's a mental component, psychological component or attack that often gets ignored. We being neophytes and new to the paranormal are way in over our head. I mean, we are so in over our heads. Let me give you an example. The first time I saged or smudged, I'm in a poltergeist house, you know. The first time I saged or smudged, I had all the windows closed, all the doors closed. And I went to sleep. Baby, bye bye. Twenty minutes after I smudged or saged in the Bothell House of all houses, I later learned that's a huge no no. You don't smudge with windows and doors open because you keep in there trapping the energy in. And if your house is giving you malevolent activity, which ours was at the time, going to sleep could be very dangerous. And it was. We were attacked while sleeping. I was attacked while sleeping. Objects are thrown spontaneous fires, <laughs> you know, yeah. but the poltergeist is not going to tell me that. It's not going to say, hey, I want to suggest smudging right now, Mr. Linder. You know, it doesn't, because it's not working in its favor. So that's how yeah, we were over our heads. We were so in over our heads. Okay, Keith, the reason I like talking to you is because I've had my own experience with this stuff. And uh, uh, somebody I knew left some baggage in my home. And so I had another friend come in, and immediately the I it was like, oh gosh, this is here. So we did the smudge thing, leaving the front door open to get that, you know to, to direct it around through the house and out the front door. When we tried to go through the front door, the screen glass door, that door was being held shut from the opposite side. I had to 
push very hard to get that door open and hold it open as we exited with the sage smoke. So I know what you're talking about. That's why it's like this story is legit. I've been there. I know what you're talking about. And it's not a cakewalk because it's a mental thing of how do I get around something I can't see that actually knows what I'm thinking and what I'm going to do before I do it. That's what you're looking at. Yeah, they see everything I do, Tina does, the investigators. You know, when, I mean, the people come in the home, right? They got to set up the equipment. They got to power charge it up. They got to put wire down, put cameras up. The poultry guy sees all that. It's, it's not like they come home and like, oh, what behold, where, where did all this stuff come from? They see all that. They see the conversation, the plan of action, the template they're going to run as to how we're going to try to solve this case. And we got the voices to prove it. You know, the parapsychologist, Steve Mara, a doc fellow from the UK, who stayed in the house two and a half weeks, got e- remarkable EVPs, where you hear the unexplained voices talk underneath Steve and Dawn about the equipment Steve and Dawn are setting up. It just riddled and blew my mind when they were able to show me that audio file of a mysterious male voice talking to another mysterious male voice. Clear as day, like I'm talking to you. Of course, you can hear with the naked ear, but the voice recorders and video camera recorded it beautifully. And they are talking intelligently like I would talk to you if we were to observe somebody setting up cameras. We'd be like, oh, what model number is that? Oh, what? Oh, I have that breast. Oh, Saudi JVC? Yeah, uh, okay. And that's what the, 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 the unexplained voices are, are doing. And one of you goes so far as to say, hey, go take one. You know, go take one of those cameras. Give it orders to go take one of these high expensive cameras that the investigative team has brought in. And like I said, verifiable because it's on, on my YouTube channel, links are in my book, and it just riddles the mind. See, it's one of the best cases because you are so tenacious, so determined, so curious and stubborn. There, there are very few people who are willing to follow this or willing to engage it, which is what you've done. And I, you know, I know in some ways it's, it's reluctant, but the other thing is like, again, you can't, stop because you're so incredibly curious that even when you move from location to location, you now have that attachment. But yep. explain, I mean, the heartbeat in the in the mattress. Yeah, well, the, the heartbeat and the, I guess, the mattress indentations began uh, in the Bothell house, but did not subside when I moved out, for disclosure, I no, I no longer lived there. But they followed me, and you're right. Um, it's these weird pulsations coming from both mattress and pillow, uh, sometimes the headboard. And me, I, I feel blessed because I was able to buy online these high expensive, highly expensive stethoscopes, digital stethoscopes. Because I, you know, I'm always thinking, you know, I can talk about it all day, but other people are going to have to hear this. And, what device out there exists where you can capture a heartbeat other than one well, coming from your own heart. But I got these digital stethoscopes and I set them up in my bedroom and I can house monitor miles away. These are Bluetooth, Wi-Fi enabled, expensive digital stethoscopes. And I was lucky and I was able to capture these disembodied heartbeat. I wasn't expected to, but I was. And just to make sure that I've gotten my eyes and crossing my T's, I sent the audio file to friends of mine who some knew about my paranormal, some didn't, but they were doctors and nurses in the medical field, EMT, firemen, who know a little bit about EKG and heartbeats and whatnot. And I gave it to a heart specialist, a heart surgeon, one of my friends, and it blew their mind. They said, whoever has this, because they got the chart and they took EKG and all that stuff, they're like, Whoever has this heart is a person that's about to die. And that's what they were able to determine. I, I can't read the EKG. I can just see the, the line go up and down, but I don't know what that means. This is their job. And they knew, and they're like, where'd you get this? And I told them, I'm like, well, do you really want to know? i like, <laughs> uh, my mattress. <laughs> and then like, the ones that knew about the Bothell house is like, yeah, that's why, that's why I don't go to your house, key. But Science, you know, I give this to science and science, you know, drops the ball or doesn't have an answer for it, but it's there. You know, it's still there to this day, the, the audio and the, the mattress indentations and whatnot. And it's not like I'm special or unique because other Portuguese cases where the house occupants talk about the same thing, you know, about disembodied heartbeats and mattress, like an invisible cat or dog 
into your bedroom or jump on your bed, but there's no cat or dog. It's just the mattress going, you know, indentations as it makes its way towards you. And I've had that. I still experience that. I still experience the, the swoosh, the little energy that goes from one side of my body to the other or exits, or sometimes it doesn't exit. And do you have any telepathic, like audio voices in your head, any kind of engagement in that way? Uh, that's a good question. I've been told by others that maybe I can tell people I have intuition. I have a little bit of keen insight. Um, there's a, definitely a weird connection. This is going to sound weird. You know, some of the spirits or entities that I've been dealing with over the years, Steve Marion Dolphin has witnessed this in, in, the, in the Boston home. They seem to want the evidence to get out there. They seem to want to be a willing participant, albeit on their terms, of what I can release and what I can't. Like if I go, I've noticed over time, if I go real deep into the shadowy figures that I've seen, then there's equipment malfunction and there's interference between me and the interviewer. They're like, we, we, we can't hear you anymore, Keith. You switch to another topic, then the audio is fine. It's just certain subject matter brings on this equipment malfunction. A good example I'll give you is a year ago, almost two years ago, I uploaded on my YouTube channel a video about fire poltergeist, you know, spontaneous combustion and related to poltergeist activity. I included in the video my case and other cases throughout history where there was a report of fire in a poltergeist home. And then in my video, I show a little um, clip of what I believe how the poltergeists are able to do that. And I go into depth what is called black body radiation. It's about an hour and a half video. And I kid you not, when I uploaded the video, it's a true story, onto YouTube, and, and those who ever uploaded the video to YouTube, you know it's not almost instantaneous, but it's close. And as soon as I hit the, I guess the enter or the click on my mouse to upload, my fire alarm and my third place of residence start going off. I've not had a fire alarm go off since the Bothell House, so I'm still sort of PSD about that. And I freak out. I get up from my office, and smoke is billowing from my bedroom. I have a fire in my bedroom. There's a candle that I had burning that was sitting on the entertainment center, nearly exhausted of, of, of oil or wax or whatever. But flames are billowing it out of like no tomorrow. And my house or my apartment filled up with smoke. And it took me a while to distinguish the smoke and, and, and the fire. I was shivering like a leaf because it brought me back a flashback into the Bothell home where we had the poster catch fire and the Bibles catch fire. And I remember when I finally extinguished the fire, I was like, what caused this fire? And I look into the candle. There's an object in the candle that caused the flames to ignite. I still don't know to this day what the object is because when the wax rehardened, it solidified around the object, and I'm too scared to melt the candle again to even touch whatever that object is. Mm -hmm. But I have. I went back to my YouTube channel, and the video uploaded um, successfully. But the both things happened at the same exact time, and I know me. I know me. That's not a coincidence. To upload a video about pyro, poltergeist activity, and at the same second, I mean exact same second, a fire billows out my bedroom. Yeah, part of this has to do with our own thoughts and how conscious we are when we are drawing or magnetizing, energizing, radiating, and bringing something on another plane into our space. And I think you do that effectively without knowing it. I do think this has to have been a past life for you, experience, talent, ability that um, you, you forgot that is also giving you an extra boost when it comes to these kinds of experiences. And I agree. A lot of times there are spaces you go into and it isn't about scaring you away. It's about waking you up. It's saying, Hey, you're not alone. We're here too. And we were here yeah. first. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I always ask the question, you know, why me? And I'm pretty sure they'd be like, why not you? Because you're right. One of the things 
you know, I often, not often, but I used to, but it, it happens periodically still when I'm searching my case or other cases and trying to compare the other cases to mine. Every now and then I'll run, a, I'll run into on the, on the internet a treasure trove of good evidence that helps relate to my case. And I'm like, and my eyes light up like a kid in the candy store because I'm like, what they experienced that too? And you know, uh, it takes one to know what type of thing. So I'm, yeah. I'm reading the, the history and the audio and all that stuff. And I'm just downloading it, backing it up on my cloud drives and all that stuff. And then, kid you not, I hear a whisper in my ear say, Keith. Sometimes it's female. Sometimes it's male. Most times it's female. And it's, it's always during the times when I encounter a huge revelation about poltergeist activity uh, that relates to my case. Mm-hmm. And going back to what I was saying about Steve and Dawn had their own similar experience about what I believe or supports my theory that there are entities out there or Portuguese the out there, especially in the Bauhaus, who seem to relish the idea of some of the evidence getting out. Because the day Steve and Dawn were packing to leave, you know, they've been there eight days straight and, and they're ready to go to the airport. And the cabs pulled up to the driveway. And so they're loading their crates and stuff into the cab. And we're all saying our goodbyes and stuff. And all the fire alarms in the house started chirping uncharacteristically. Like every fire alarm, like, dee, 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 dee. You know, I was, I, I'm not a Morse code guy, but I it has, it had to be some Morse code going on. And I remember the look on Steve's face and Dawn's face because they're investigators. And this is what they do. And to be tempted to want to cancel that flight reservation Stay a day longer because it was it, it was like Disneyland in that house for a researcher uh-huh. who was uh, worth his or her salt uh, because the evidence was just coming willingly. It was so much, and this was landing in their lap. And if you ever watch Steve Mara's commentary about the Bothell House, one of his biggest complaints is a good complaint is it's just so much stuff. You know, you could spend eternity on the amount of data that he and others got in that house. And it was not showing signs of subsiding in the activity or the ability to capture evidence on the day that they were leaving. But you eventually got to go. I mean, they got a life in the UK. They got a, a visa. They can't overstay it. They got to get out of here. And the Portuguese are like, no, 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 stay, stay, stay. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. We're ringing all the alarms. We're, beep, we beep, like stay, you. Stay, stay. <laughs> we like you guys. Stay, stay, stay. We'll be good. We'll be good. <laughs> you know? And it's just like, it was just unbelievable. Stephen Dodd, it was like, yeah, we wanted to stay, but we couldn't. Keith Linder, no matter what people say about ghosts, when it's happening to you in your house and in more than one house, then you start questioning, so what's real here? The Bothell Hell House, again, that's the first book, Poltergeist of Washington State, Wendy's Coffee House. In the very beginning, when Keith was still skeptic and not really ready to buy into the fact that the house was haunted, and not only that, it could be a poltergeist, which is a very interactive haunting, uh, he threatened him, told him to get out. So how'd that go? It humbled me and made me pivot to another strategy. Keith Linder is my guest. Anybody who is involved with you, who has any kind of connection can also have this experience. I interviewed you when I was working at KCMO and I forgot yeah. to bring the phone number. I never do that. This is, this is, you know, an interview. I go in, I, the phone number is like priority. So I have to come back to the house. And the first and only time I ever did that came back to the house, the outdoor, the spigot for the water is running. It had been turned yeah. on. And I'm thinking, well, yeah. okay, this is the interview with Keith. Thank you. A good thing. I forgot my phone <laughs> and for my phone number. <laughs> So. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, some of my friends, you know, I, you know, I, I go to their dinner parties or house parties, or Christmas or whatever birthday, and some of them it, 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 it bewilders them or freaks them out because we all be lollygagging, talking, right, and then the doorbell will ring, and then I go downstairs and there's, there's nobody at the door. Mm-hmm. They come back upstairs, ding ding, mm-hmm. go back down, and I said that's never happened before, or. When before COVID, I used to take a van pool to work to downtown Seattle. I live in Bothell, so it was a 30 minute ride. And the van pool, we all meet about eight of us in the van pool. The van pool driver is allowed to take the van to their home. That's what they do. If you're the driver of the van pool, you can take the van to your home. 
and they know about my boss and how to know about my situation, but uh, they know, but they don't know. And they, he, uh, it never fails the day or the day before where we talk or somebody asks me about a Bothell house or something. The van pool driver picks us up and he's like, Keith. I'm like, yeah, what? He says, uh, well, I left my house this morning to warm up the van pool. Every door was open. And the key, the little key fob that gets us into the building where we work at, which I always keep on top of the refrigerator, was sitting in the driver's seat. And then I'm like, yeah, that's them. That's, that's them. Or they'll tell me, or the van pool driver will text me. It'd be like a Sunday on the weekend. So Keith, all the lights in the van pool are blinking off and on, and the horn is going dee, 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 dee. You know, and my neighbors are just driving my neighbors crazy. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's some spillover there. Uh, the plus, the positive and negatives is the negative side is it scares some what I believe to be some potential girlfriends away yeah. from me who had activity at their home, uh, didn't wish for it, did not deal with it. And that's fine um, in that regard. But uh, And they'll text me with stories to tell um, about what the activity they're having. And I'm like, yeah, like, I mean, I'm not talking about small stuff. I'm talking about all the kitchen cabinet doors open after our first date. <laughs> or the dog uncharacteristically pees the floor or is barking at the corner. One lady had an elevator in her home, lucky her, and the elevator kept going up and down uncontrollably. The electrician came out days later and I couldn't figure out who caused it. He's like, I've been doing this 30 years. I've never seen an elevator do that. The amount of activity for you is so extensive. It is something that is a challenge for anybody else who wants to be involved with you because of that, because it, it, it brings anybody else in. And um, people yeah. who live in haunted houses, there's, uh, I know of somebody in our area whose children will not go back to the house they grew up in. At one point, the, the two older siblings were upstairs and they had extremely frightening experiences. When the young daughter went up there, she went goth and she came downstairs and her personality changed. But they all have had experiences. The parents, the mom likes the house. It's her home. And she's yeah. not leaving. That's the kind of stuff that it does with families. It's like if you don't have a strong will and um, basically, you know, nerves of steel, then this isn't for you. This is, and that's, I think, with the girlfriends, they're saying, okay, how much of this can you take? And so you might as well get it out of the shoot right off the bat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can't deal with the cabinets all open, well, then see ya. Yeah, you can't deal with that. And, and, and to that credit, I mean, some, I, I'm sort of torn because. I don't divulge it automatically, but if you ask me, I will. And most, you know, they will Google my name after a date one or date two, and Bothell stuff flies at you on Google if you Google Keith Linder's name, mm-hmm. so they know. So the cat's out the bag. But so I've had I've had two reactions. I've had those who are like, "Oh no, I'm not going to see them more." Bye. Or those where I ain't scared of no ghosts. <laughs> and and I and I kind of hate the ones who say. I mean, by what they say about it, when I say I ain't scared of no right, ghosts, because right. I know what's going That's inviting my, you know, these spirits. Oh, yes. you're not really? Oh, okay. Well, let's open up her kitchen cabinet doors. And I'm like, and I always say, hey, don't say that or don't say that out loud or, you know, whatever. Oh, no, I ain't scared of no ghosts. I, I was a Portuguese will follow me home. And I, and I put my hands in my, my head in my hands and I'm like, no, don't say that. <laughs> and sure enough. I get that text message a, a day or two later. They're like, hey, Keith, you're a nice guy, but... Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, no. yeah. I was in college, my girlfriend, um, and this is at Pittsburgh State, in the dorm. You know, that's not haunted. No, uh-uh. So we're in the basement floor uh, yeah. in the dorm. I uh, walked in the room. We were having, for some reason, a conversation about ghosts. She's sitting near the window, and she says, I don't believe in ghosts. And I think she said the same thing. I'm not afraid of ghosts. The curtains behind her came straight out. And so she's seeing them beside her about, you know, head level, seeing these curtains. And she, immediately the cowardly lion on the Wizard of Oz, I do believe in ghosts. I do believe in ghosts. I do. And I thought that was a really, you know, like a grandstand performance. And I thought, okay, maybe we need to tone it down. <laughs> yeah. Not talk about maybe. this. Yeah. 
Because they're always around. They're always listening. And, you know, if you challenge them, and especially the ones in our house, if you, if you put the gauntlet down, they're going to take you up on it. And, and it humbled me. I mean, I was just like that way, too, not knowing what I was fighting or dealing with. I, I used to be that same guy in my house telling them, get out of my house or else. You were brazen. Or else you, what? Yeah, you were brazen. <laughs> you really kind of went full throttle on, this is mine. Yeah. We're going head to head. And they're like, okay, let's go. Yeah. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> you go head to head. Okay. All right. And then, so it humbled me and made me pivot to another strategy. But yeah, I, I have friends who encounter or tell me their own stories or things that I tell people don't challenge or. You don't have to be gun ho around me to get to know me. I say, ghost be gone. Just get to know me. Because if you challenge them or something, they're going to take you up on it. And it's, it's on their terms or where you're trying to sleep or whatever. And one friend of mine lost her passport at the airport, so she missed her flight out. And so, yeah, all kind of things can happen. Another person lost her cell phone. And yeah, they can inconvenience you if they want to. The one thing I saw in the, you know, as your relationship progressed and you became more informed and more aware of your own thoughts is that you became more respectful. That was a big change. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a, 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 just a learning curve, if you will, of, you know, would I have to agree a hundred percent for me not to respect you? I respect that, which I can't see. Uh, I understand by looking into the abyss, the abyss is looking into me, and I need to tread lightly. And uh, most of my videos, if you see on my YouTube channel or elsewhere, I will open and close with, hey, this video is for research purposes only. It's not for, you know, the thrill seeker. This is not for me, you know, being vain or having vanity. This is for research purposes only. Thank you. And I'm trying to hope open and close that door as I'm finished. And let me, and I'm always appreciative. Whatever evidence I get, I know it's not me, per se. It's them, you know, like in the way I ask. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I said when I did the fire video, they were like, okay, dude, all right. You know, don't get too far ahead of yourself telling the world about how we do this fire thing. <laughs> you know, so yeah. Amazon, the book, and this is for the Bothell Hell House, Poltergeist of Washington State. The reviews, 200, 200. And this takes a little time, a little, somebody's got to be motivated to go on and put a review. Deb's best paranormal book ever. Seriously, she says, the most enthralling paranormal book I've ever read. I could not put it down. The things that Keith and Tina experienced were terrifying and intriguing at the same time. Keith documented all the happenings, and if you purchase the Kindle edition, he put actual links to see for yourself what they experienced. Also has a YouTube channel. You can see even more. I recommend this book to anyone questioning the paranormal as well as people who are interested in it. If you're a skeptic, I think this book may change your opinion and joy. That's an excellent review. And I think, you know, the, the Kindle thing with the links is excellent, too, because you do have some fantastic YouTube videos. And the deal with this is you're an IT guy. And most people, they experience something like this. They don't write down every little thing. You are also incredibly, hmm, anal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You document everything. That's fantastic. That's an asset. It's one of those things that when you have something like this, you know, there aren't enough people who are able to do what you do. And so you have brought that so much, so much more to the fore with all of those details, all of that evidence, all of that firsthand account. So that's what's extraordinary about your case and the fact that it continues to happen because you've given it an open door. Yeah. And when I wrote, when I wrote Bothell Hell House and the two books after, one of the things I wanted to make sure to separate my book from others is take advantage of today's technology, today's accessibility. You know, we we can access the internet from our phones now, from our smart devices, from Bluetooth. And I want to put the links of everything I said or saw, if I could, in the book. You know, and I've gotten emails from people who are reading a certain chapter and when me and Tina hear a loud bang and get scared out of our bed and fall to the floor. Uh, if I had a device running and was able to capture that bang, it's in the book. 
And I've had readers say, oh, my gosh, I heard that bang. Oh, man, wow. Because it puts them sort of in there and in, in that mode of 2 a.m., 3 a.m., was sleeping and they themselves. And I've gotten good feedback from other people who read and go to the links and whatnot. And uh, the researchers love it because they're able to catalog and see date, time, stamp, day of the week, year. And from a researcher's point of view, they love it. They love that accuracy. They love that, you know, the story is consistent throughout the years. It's maintained a level of consistency that I wanted to freeze in time. And by doing that, freeze in time is what I did was put all the evidence on the internet. So it's frozen in time. So I've never, and it'll never happen. Nobody will ever be able to use my words against me. Oh, I got you. You said yeah, in your book, or now you said, you know, no, 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 no. What I say today, you can go back to my book, and you'll see I've said the same thing. The story, you know, since 2012 has not changed, and it won't change. That's part of it, too, though, is that accuracy with documentation. My fail-safe is if I document it and write it so that then I know I can go back, oh, yeah. this, is, this is what it is. This is, you know, I might have misspoken there, but here, this is what I stand by, is what I have written and what I have documented. Yeah, this is what I, this is what I got. This is what you can always go back and check, you know, the source of truth that we like to say in IT. This is the source of truth right here. It's in Keith Linder's own words. Um, that's why I opted to self-publish. You know, there's a lot of pros and cons by self-publishing. I wanted to self-publish because I did not want anything shortened, cut out, you know, added in, things of that nature. Um, yeah, it's a 434 pages, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good 434 pages. It's not the, the Hollywood version. It's the true version. Um, I don't want to condense it and slice it up into 200 pages as I was advised to do by publishing companies. No, I want, I, I want to tell the whole story and provide evidence where they uh, happened in the books. And uh, yeah, the feedback's been good. Yeah, there are people who say, hey, condense it, consolidate it. And that's short attention span issues. <laughs> right, that's the give me, give me, give me mindset. You know, uh -huh. Give me, give me, give, give me the bare facts. And I believe with poltergeist phenomena, especially told from the house occupant's point of view, which I believe is important, you don't want to, it can always be, you know, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Because there's so many things. If I left off certain things that happened to me and Tina, you know, that's evidence. That's important things. You know, you go to the doctor or whatever. They they want to know everything was alien. They don't want you to shorten it or give them half of what's alien. You want, give me all your symptoms, kids. They don't, 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 don't be shy or bashful because I can't troubleshoot you if you're just going to give me half your symptoms. So I had to give the world, the paranormal community, all the symptoms of the Bible house. And you, you be a, a, a friend and on my Twitter, you see, when I find out something, what did I do? I tweet it out. If I get a haunting in my house just watching TV or Sunday night, whatever, I tweet it out. You know, my Alexa got moved to one side of the room. That was interesting. The side of the room. <laughs> yeah. And I tweet it out, like, whoa, because that hasn't happened in a while. I mean, that, I was like, whoa, that hasn't happened in a long time. What are you guys doing? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you live alone, you know, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa went for a walk. Yeah, so they like you know they let me know, hey, we're still here, and right. we, we we turn the Alexis upside down and move it over. But yeah, I tweeted out because I wanted to be captured in time and time set. You know, well, somebody who's going to study poltergeist, like Einstein studies theory, theory of relativity, is going to find my case one day and just crack it all over. They're going to be, oh yeah, oh yeah. To your credit, too, it's context. Because if you leave certain things out, sometimes there's a trail, a pattern, and something will repeat. And it may seem very innocuous, but then when you can trace that and go back and say, look, this is actually a pattern. These things happened in sequence. And if you leave anything out, you lose that. You lose, and, and to me, that's where the gold is. And so for anybody who criticizes and says, hey, it should have had an editor, I wanted a story, that's fiction. You're not doing fiction. You're documenting, and you're, that's, the whole, that's the difference between your story, your book, and why it's so much longer, because this is a documentation, and it relies yeah. on those details. Yeah, those details, it's, it's, it's told in chronological order. Uh, it's the mindset, adopting the mindset of not leaving anything out. 
mm-hmm. because I don't know what's important or not important to the reader or the researcher. Uh, it's a it's a characteristic in IT what we do that I've learned in my early years in IT of troubleshooting, not to leave anything out because others are reading it. I can't tell you how many times I've got emails from people all over the world with a similar case or activity, you know, um, and we're able to relate it to mine or vice versa. And it helps me, it helps them. I feathered other people's research by the data I provided. I'm in constant communication with SPR, the Australian Parapsychology Institute, RIN, ASSAP, all the others. We're in communication. I get emails and things of that nature. The Seattle Catholic Church will periodically call me about a, just a obnoxious case that they're dealing with that they do not have heads or tails on how to solve. And they'll email me or call me. And these are things happening in the state of Washington that the Catholic Church is dealing with. It doesn't make the front page news or oh. the back page paper, but it happens more often than people realize. Well, and that's, they like calling me. Yeah, that, that's something that our, our society has yet to really confront and uh, deal with. In your own experience, you have made a tremendous transformation because at the beginning of this, there was... Um, It would be like an assault and battery. You were traumatized, you were angry, resentful, and the why me thing. Um, It was all this, what did I do to deserve this? And so from there, you went to really, really diving in and immersing yourself into, okay, how can I understand more of why this is happening, how it can happen, and then then you begin to engage more with it and saying, okay, if it's going to happen, I'm going to figure it out. So that's where I see you now is that you are so much more uh, accepting and appreciative and respectful of, okay, these things are happening and I'm here to help not to harm. I'm helping. And it's, it's a whole different change in your personality. Does that, I mean, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Cause I think in mentioning that, had this conversation in the Bothell House. It's always one of those unanswered questions for me. I kind of know, but I don't know. Um, Tina never saw the apparitions. Tina never saw the gray lady, the white lady. Something or the entities or the gray lady saw something in me to reveal themselves. They're like, you're the guy we're going to reveal ourselves to. Everybody don't see apparitions. Mm hmm. I didn't wake up one day and say, I hope to see an apparition in the ball. So I didn't know what an apparition was until after I saw it. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah. So I, I wasn't walking around saying, show me, show me, show me. But if they saw something. It's sort of like a kid call. There's been multiple people living in the Bothell house. These entities, for lack of a better word, saw me and Tina on May 1st. We were in the house no more than maybe 20 minutes. And they said, kid call. You know, mm-hmm. something in our persona and our makeup that they saw potential in. So you can sort of you can sort of make the case of uh, they knew where Keith would take this. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Versus the family before, or the family before. You know, ah, this oh this couple, because they instantaneous, not days or weeks or months, like some poltergeist cases. Yes. Where you have to live with all they immediately. Leap into action. And they're like, ah, new couple, ah, come on, do it, kick up, do it now. You know? And they knew that would create some sort of snowball domino effect. And here we are, you know, many years later. Yeah. Yeah, but see, it was non threatening. It was non threatening. It was innocuous. And you guys kind of, yeah, okay, well, well, right. So it didn't frighten you out the door, which for some people is like, okay, not here, this home. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Don't play this Which game. Itself, I told Steve this one, Steve Meredith. I said, you know what? There's a lesson in that of people always talking about, oh, if I would have heard a, a kid call, I would have been running out the house. I said, well, okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. You probably wouldn't run out the house, or, or maybe not, but I'll take your word for it if you probably would. Because so many people tell me that same thing. But have you ever thought about it from the other side's point of view? Of uh, It would be the equivalent of me saying, you walking into the house, Wendy, for the first time ever. I've already been here, you know, before the house was built, but I'm here. Mm-hmm. And then I say hello to you, 
and then you run out the door. <laughs> the spirits are probably talking about, well, what the heck did we do? Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to establish contact. Yeah, yeah. You know, it may be weird, maybe a little bit awkward, but hey, we live in a weird dimension compared to where you live. But, you know, your, your dimension is weird to us, ours is weird to you, but y'all run into the hills. Yeah. That's rude. <laughs> you know? That's rude. <laughs> yeah, that's so rude. And we're trying to give you the keys to the secrets of life, but y'all always run it. Yep. Whereas me and Tina, we didn't run. No. You know, we, no. we thought about it, but we didn't run. <laughs> What, what's going on with you now? Because, again, this has been a few years, and it's still happening in a different way. I mean, when people are calling you for advice, you've come a long way from that first kid cough. Uh, yeah, where I'm at now, like I said, I'm in my second place of residence since the Bothell house. I still live in Bothell. Uh, COVID has me working majority of the time from home. Mm-hmm. I'm still in IT, still with the same company. I field or filter emails from all over the world and work with different teams. Uh, I review my evidence in theirs. I work a few cases uh, as a consultant, especially helping house occupants out dealing with their frightening situation. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I was there. I've been there done that. Um, currently still researching uh, two books I'm writing at the same time. One is dealing with the spontaneous fire phenomena. Mm related to poltergeist cases and the second book is dealing with wall writings poltergeist cases throughout history uh dealing with wall writers and communication where we have documented cases of poltergeists developing the ability to speak you know there there, 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 there are many documented poltergeist cases uh where the entity or presence in the home spoke verbally out loud to the house occupants. We didn't have that so much, uh, but the wall writings, you know, the things left on paper or wall, how are they, you know, the post they say, to do that, what does it mean? Go back to that thing, or maybe they're trying to communicate to us. Things of that nature. So that in the, in the, in the fire book, Pyro Poetry Guys, uh, I concluded the night side of physics, my third book with the theory or the question out there to the community. Uh, I believe poltergeists are a species like we are, they're species. And within that species, different poltergeists execute or have different abilities. There's a specific poltergeist in the species of poltergeist or paranormal or ghost or whatever, who has a proclivity of starting fires. Mm-hmm. This is, this is just what they do. Not all Portuguese cases have reported fires breaking out. Right. The extreme ones have. I know the ones in the Bothell house who did fires um, generally didn't stay in the Bothell home. They would just pay us a visit. <laughs> they, yeah. They would just, and you, you knew when they were in the home because the mood in the home would change. It would yeah. go from zero to ten. And then once they did the little fire thing, they're, they're, they're done. They're like, there we go. And the other spirits or entities would get out of their way. They're like, oh, oh, pyro guys here. Okay. You know? Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it would be the, my example to put my nerd hat on. It would be like the Empire from Star Wars lore, the Empire, you know, Stormtroopers, and then Darth Vader walks in. Well, we know the Stormtroopers and the Empire are all bad. You know, you're not going to have a good day dealing with them. They come to your town, right? Mm-hmm. But, all right. But when Vader shows up, oh, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even the Stormtroopers and the officers and the lieutenants are like, Shaking in their boots. Vacation, the vacation, yeah, yeah, time off. You know, okay, I'm going. I'm putting in a transfer. I'm transferring out of this unit. Yeah, you know, because Vader don't. He don't love them as much as he loves you. He's just there to handle his own business. And as we see, if you watch the movie, he they pay the prices equally as the the good guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if they fail, if they fail, the pyros in my opinion are the same way. The books available, you've got three of them available on Amazon. Also, your information there. You're also on Twitter and YouTube. 
if you're not familiar with this and you're listening, check out the first book on the Bothell Hill House. Start there. But if you also have had activity, follow Keith on Twitter just to kind of keep in touch with things that do happen. And this yeah. is, you know, your real life story. This isn't something that you're fictionalizing. It's this, this is, this is what's happening day in and day out. And I like that because it gives us an idea that there's more going on here than the normal nine to five stuff where everything is tuned out. This is when you tune in and say, Whoa, what else is happening? And Keith, you've got the details. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot happening, a lot happening in a 24 hour period that the human naked eye cannot see, but it's real. It's Absolutely. happening right underneath our noses right now, you know, and it just riddles and riddles and blows my mind. Oh, what's your website? Oh, website, uh, demonsinseattle.com, all lowercase. Keith L on YouTube, just type in Keith L, you'll find my YouTube channel. Hundreds of videos, I think it's up to 600 now. I forget how many hours of actual video footage. Talk about the several hundred thousands of hours of video footage. Uh, you mentioned the books on, on Amazon. The documentary, Demons in Seattle, Uncovered. Hour and a half, superb documentary. Yeah. From the researcher's point of view, I shut up in this in this documentary and let the researchers do what it is they do. And the evidence is overpowering. It's remarkable. Yeah, well, it's, that's on YouTube as well. Excellent documentary. Hey, you, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And I'm going to stay in touch. And, of course, yeah, following you on Twitter <laughs> just to see where oh, Alexa yeah. goes next. <laughs> exactly right anything you want to add no thanks for having me uh stay safe out there everyone and if you want questions answered find me on uh, on the internet that's where i'll be and i'll post the links in the description for the show but do a google search you can find keith linder the bothell hell house poltergeist of washington state and the fact that Keith is an IT professional, I think, does a lot to help this case and bring a lot more evidence that would just evaporate to the fore. And you can follow him, just not too close, because attachments can travel. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Thanks for listening. Stay curious.